Well, welcome to Environmental Coffee House. I am your host, Sandy Shellis, and today we have a special guest, Matthew Azoulay. Epic Tomorrows is what I understand he calls himself or the project, and he's going to talk a lot about it. But what I thought is I would start out with something that I think is quite beautiful. And Matthew wrote this, and he has a vision of Epic Tomorrows. And the vision goes way beyond the mission because the vision is essentially the kind of planet I, meaning Matthew, optimistically envision being a reality a few decades from now. What all the work should point to. This is a vision of global society that has possibly, although ideally not, gone through severe collapse, including war, but which has rebirthed Phoenix-like into a post-capitalist ecological form free of all oppressive hierarchies. While such a utopia may not be conceivable everywhere, it surely could happen somewhere, and more than one somewheres. The more, the merrier. So welcome. It's so nice to have you. Thank you, Sandy, so much for reading that. I'd, I'd forgotten I'd written it, actually, but it's really nice that you brought it up again. Um, and my vision has probably darkened a tiny bit since I wrote that. Um, but I still think, yeah, that there is there are there are hopeful or I shouldn't say hopeful, but realistic, positive um, opportunities for people and, and realities that could happen even though we all know that some kind of collapse is is almost certain and and probably underway right now we can see the signs of it now and i know yeah. all of your guests or many of your guests know that right oh absolutely um, i would say that most everyone is if they're not collapse accepted they're collapse aware sure and we absolutely. follow a lot of the same people i'm sure yeah it's great to see paul beckwith um popping up on your channel I, I always watch his videos to keep updated on you know Absolutely. what's going on in the arctic and everything and uh, i love his kind of downbeat style he's you know. great he's a good person yeah. good friend i i consider yeah no bullshit no nope. nope so matthew when you when you have this you had this brainstorm and collaboration how did it actually start to do this project, I know you're going to talk about it, the ecological crisis collapse and revolutionary change. Talk about it. Give us the the, the bullet points, the the mission, vision, and, and values, although I read a little of it, of this project. Okay, sure. Well, actually, I, I have to separate here between Epic Tomorrows and the book project. Okay. Um, Epic Tomorrows is kind of my personal activist project um, and YouTube channel. And that has definitely informed my thinking um, over the past few years and really focused my mind on, on um, what kind of pathways I envisage forward for, for all of us and, and for myself. Um, but this particular book project about ecological crisis, collapse and revolutionary change is with the charity publisher Arcbound, yes. which is a UK based publisher. And that's nothing to do with Epic Tomorrows. Um, but I think the people at Arcbound did, they were aware of my work with Epic Tomorrows. And that's partly why they gave me this job of editing this book. Um, and it's a multi-author book. Um, and the charity has already, has always been about kind of diversity and, and platforming diverse voices in the publishing industry, because, you know, the publishing industry is not diverse enough. Um, so yeah and and we've already published a couple of books about climate adaptation um and mitigation but just recently the the coordinator of arcbound steve mcnaught he has become collapse aware himself so it's basically it's basically a, a good it, it was a, a complete chance that me and him kind of aligned on that kind of thinking and so he was going to do the book himself, coordinate it, but he said he didn't have time anymore and would I like to take it on? And I've never yes. edited a book in my life. So it's Ooh, a really exciting thing. I, I have edited say... work, but not a whole book. Um, and so, yeah. Congratulations. I've been thank you. Yeah. Thank you. So I've been collecting stuff from 
all around the world, like writing to my existing activist contacts who I got through Epic Tomorrows for this book project. Um, and it's going really well. Um, we just need to raise a bit more money. We've just got one week left to raise like one and a half thousand pounds on the crowd. Right, everybody. Account. You hear that? <laughs> yeah. I donated. You can too. And the link will be in the show notes. Absolutely. Thank you. So, yeah, um, if you want to ask me any more questions about the content, oh, I mean, sure. it's quite a diverse book, but. Uh, I, I'd yeah. like, we, well, we want to know all of it what you hope to accomplish who's the audience um uh is it is it something that can be a worldwide is it is it is it like a uh, something people can use as a as their guide you know tell us about okay. that okay well that's great um it's kind of an anthology approach so it's very eclectic um and it will be divided into three sections the first section will be focused on our predicament. Um, the opening chapter will be Dr. Bill McGuire, who's quite a well-known yes. climate scientist. Oh, yes. And it's really great that he's on board. Um, also, Gail Bradbrook, co-founder of XR Extinction Rebellion, will be writing the foreword. Um, and then there's also going to be a, a bit in the first section about maladaptation to the ecological crisis. Um, from diverse perspectives, particularly from my friend Violet Materu, who's a Kenyan uh, ecologist. Mm -hmm. And she has she's gathering the accounts of uh, different community members in Kenya of how the climate crisis and the ecological crisis has been used as an excuse by big NGOs like WWF and, and the Nature Conservancy who are going in and doing conservation, but it's yes. not... I mean, maybe they do do some good work in places, but certainly mm -hmm. they're doing a lot of bad work and, and they're, they're evicting indigenous people from their lands. Um, and they're doing all of these carbon offsetting schemes, which are not actually working. They're kind of a scam that, you know, sometimes they do yeah. double accounting where two companies are using the same trees oh. and claiming that it's carbon offs, all this kind of stuff. So right after Bill Maguire's chapter, it's really good to have this, these accounts from Kenya and it's happening all over Africa. Um, so an, the Western... an expose in, in a sense. It is. It is definitely an expose, the, mm -hmm. the second chapter. And so we're building up, we're starting to build up a picture of how bad things are, right? Uh, for people who for people who already know, but maybe don't know some of the details, but also for other people who maybe they know that climate change is bad, but they don't realize too much about overshoot. So overshoot will be mentioned in the first uh, chapter, Beautiful. in the first section, sorry. Mm -hmm. um, so Arcbound is kind of taking a bit of a radical direction with publishing this book because our previous books haven't addressed collapse at all. So they're taking a, a little bit of a risk, you could say. But I'm trying to introduce the readers slowly. I don't. I don't want to hit them over the head straight away by right. saying the world's going to end or whatever. Um, well, that's <laughs> that's kind of a turnoff. I mean, you're giving. Yeah. You're doing it the right way. Absolutely. Sure. Yeah. And so, and then in the second section, we look at kind of revolutionary and radical responses to the predicament. Um, there's no. There's nothing about violent revolution. I want to reassure people, but there is, there is a realistic focus on kind of civil disobedience. I know you've spoken to Roger Hallam, mm -hmm. um, you know, and also kind of community defense, communities defending themselves and and doing mutual aid and, you know, the kind of anarchistic perspective of communities working together, deciding democratically what to do with their own resources, all of this kind of stuff. And in that section, I've got Jason Bayliss from a radical, um, sorry, a radical guide.com which is a directory of anarchist and kind of radical projects from around the world and he's a very clever guy because he's kind of making anarchism sexy <laughs> and kind of main and mainstream like because a, a lot of people think that anarchism is all about wearing black and and, and like smashing windows and right stuff, but right you're actually, exactly right <laughs> yeah. yeah but most but most anarchists are peaceful people and, and they're more focused on building community resources and resi community resilience. And I think in these times of collapse, that's what we need, right? Um, so there's a focus on that. And, and I would really um, 
I'm going to be really interested in people's responses to that. People who don't really know much about that side of things, you know. Um, I think that's and, much needed, yeah. especially right, right. now with what's happening. Yeah. I mean, we just had the election in the United States. People are frightened. People need uh, something to to keep them meaningfully occupied and learn about what the potentials are. Absolutely, yeah. Things. I have I have to say, I watched, because I do follow American politics a bit. Oh, um, poor thing. I, yeah, I know, I know. And yesterday morning, I did, for some strange reason, I decided to watch Trump's victory speech. I thought I ought to try and understand what he was talking about. And I actually started crying, like, unexpectedly. I didn't really, I, I, I don't usually do that when I'm watching the news, but I, I felt so... It was when he said, oh, and we've got a new star, Elon Musk. I actually felt so dark. I had this vision of like the American government joining with the big tech and and, and it just felt like such a dark future. I just started crying spontaneously. So that, that was my response. You're not to, alone. Yeah, you're, you're, no, there's sure. millions of tears. Yeah, yeah. But exactly. you know, it seems apropos because collapse will probably be ushered in faster because of this and so yeah. your book and what your work it could become a lot more important going forward Let's that's start. true yeah but but i don't i mean i i think we have to be careful not to wish not to wish collapse to accelerate too much because it's well i don't uh, no but there no. are people that do and and yeah and in the doomer community i'm not one of them no, that's good. Neither mm -hmm. am I. That's what's that's what's known as accelerationism, right? Yeah, I don't, and that that's kind of wishing potentially more suffering on people, isn't it? So that's that's yeah. what I see it as. And and yeah. although you know th these are people that I care about, this is and and everyone is obviously <laughs> entitled to their worldview. I'm not going yeah. to put anybody down, but that's mm. why we are seeking to educate. Sure. Correct. Absolutely. Yeah. 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 So the whole book basically is, um, I mean, I've talked about the first two sections, mm -hmm. but I just want to, before I talk about the, the, the last sections, I just want to say that the whole book really comes from a, um, a community perspective. It's, it's really about platforming diverse communities from around the world and um, showing how some of these community responses are are what we need and we need diverse responses to, to overshoot and to collapse and we don't want this or in my view anyway mm -hmm. and, and in many of the authors views we don't want this top-down authoritarian government approach to responding to collapse which is likely to be fascism um or 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 even if it even like eco stalinism eco communism we don't want that either like i don't anyway i don't want that <laughs> so so the book is all about more grassroots diverse decentralized power approaches to the to, to the predicament mm -hmm. it's kind of putting forward in a very kind of subtle way is advocating for that kind of global response yes. um not not every chapter will say that not every mm -hmm. chapter but um like maybe bill mcguire in the beginning maybe he doesn't totally agree with that vision or whatever but um there will be a strong thread of that like like com empowering communities to look after themselves basically um I'm, I'm not saying we can dispense with governments. We can't. We have them. We do have governments and we have to work with them and we have to try and improve them. And, and we do have to try and vote sometimes, unfortunately, and all of that. But, but also, can the governments really respond to collapse? Are they even capable? Even, even if they were aware? Would have they we be seen even... it? Have we seen any evidence of it happening? Exactly. No. Exactly. What, what do you think yeah. of the term international socialism? um it sounds nice <laughs> it sounds very 20th century to me very 20th. Um, yeah i mean i i'm all uh, i would say i'm an internationalist in the sense of i try and express solidarity with suffering people all around the world and 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 uh, you know oppressive hierarchies around the world um and i think some kind of in my ideal world some kind of confederated international socialism might work but but i i don't i i'm a bit skeptical of strong nation states i think strong nation states 
are, are, are there to compete with each other and, and, and make enemies of each other. Um, so if there, if there can be socialism without borders, I, mean, I know it sounds that's, very... No, this is exactly where I was going. And that's why I asked you, because I'm right now grappling with the thought of, all right, international socialism, a borderless world, which may just happen because of the climate crisis because of these things happening. And I and I thought, you're the perfect person to ask if I'm on the right path of inquiry. That's all. I'm always oh, well, looking I, and I always say, learning. Yeah, I mean, I mean, the, the, yeah, I would say that the kind of socialism I, I personally lean towards is communalism, which is Murray Bookchin's yes. kind of vision and social ecology. You know, some people call his brand of uh, uh, politics and action they they call it a kind of socialism and and other people call it a kind of anarchism so it's kind of mm -hmm. in the middle it, give us a little always... background on murray for people that may not know i know who he is obviously for years of you know doing what i've been doing but there might be people sure. that are watching us that don't know who murray bookchin is absolutely so murray bookchin um he he, he was based in vermont mainly in america and uh, from the 1960s, he wrote a lot and, and campaigned um, around left, left libertarian politics. So he's, he actually started off as a Marxist. He came from a Marxist family. His parents were Marxists. But very young, while he was still very young, he rejected the kind of dogma of Marxism and the kind of authoritarianism element to it. Mm -hmm. And then he became much more of an anarchist, kind of identified as an anarchist. And he, he did a lot of reading, a lot of research, a lot of writing. Um, but then nature became increasingly important to him, like the, the domination of nature by human beings. And he's one of the few very left wing, like anarchistic thinkers who really centers nature. Um, right. So he came up with this new kind of concept of social ecology like so he kind of moved on he went through marxism then he went through anarchism and then he came up with a kind of synthesis which includes some anarchist thought it includes some marxist thought but it also includes very very deep connection to nature and his particular nature philosophy which he bases everything else on is called dialectical naturalism and dialectical naturalism there's many, many elements to it, but the most simple element to it, which I think is beautifully simple, is that we need to stop dominating each other as human beings and, and stop dominating nature, or, or rather, sorry, we need to stop dominating each other as human beings, and then we will be able to stop destroying nature. Right. And, we, and vice versa, we need to stop destroying nature in order to stop dominating each other as human beings. So social justice and ecological justice, you know, that's, that's kind of become quite trendy in the last few years. But still, a lot of people don't still don't really link them together enough, do they? Um, so it's about, um, yeah, for, for Murray Butchin, it was about getting rid of all hierarchies uh, in order that we can protect or live in harmony with nature in what he calls an ecological society. And for him, an ecological society is decentralized communities of people all over the world, um, kind of confederated together. It, it, I would say it is yes. a type of international socialism, yeah. what you said. Um, but in his vision, there is a strongly anarchistic element. Uh, he, he retains from anarchism the idea of no state. And for most people, the idea of having no national government at all, only, only local governments, that for most people that's like, whoa. They can't, you know, yes, like, nobody can yeah. conceive of this, yeah. How, especially in the United States. Oh, my God. Absolutely. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So this kind of vision has gone into my Epic Tomorrow's activist writing and YouTube channel and so on, but and it's also informing my editing of the book. But I wouldn't say that, most of the chapters come from a social ecological perspective. I mean, there is one chapter towards the end, which is different contributors, writers from the Institute for Social Ecology based in Vermont. Nice. And, and one of those, Chaya Heller, who's actually my personal mentor, she was taught by Murray Bookchin. So that's, yes. is a, there is a link. Yeah. Um, and can I just, nice. fin I know I'm talking a lot. Can I no, just finish? This is, wait, this is your show. Yeah. 
everybody <laughs> i'm not i am simply here for giving you a voice in a vehicle which is my role fantastic Keep thank going. you sandy so yeah i explained that the first section of the book is kind of uh, explaining to folk how serious the ecological crisis is, uh, overshoot the predicament. And because Arcbound doesn't usually publish books like this, I'm hoping that we will get through to some people who are not collapse aware, who will become collapse aware, or who at least will mm -hmm. realise how serious even just the climate situation is. Because a lot of people think, oh, the IPCC are working it out. Yeah, but they're I not. Know. They're not. So, we, 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 yeah, we know that. As you know, yeah. Um, so that's the first section. The second section is kind of revolutionary ideas and things, as I said, and communities, how they're responding. And then the third section, we're really going deep into collapse, or, or, or it could be, we haven't quite worked out yet. Um, I've got volunteers working with me. Um, one volunteer in particular, Aurora, uh, I can't remember her surname, uh, Sousa, Basso, Sousa, mm -hmm. Aurora. Sorry, Aurora, if you're watching, I forgot your surname. But um, she's a really great climate and uh, social justice activist from Brazil. And she's helping me with some of the editing of the kind of structure of the book at the moment. And we're not sure about how many sections, but it'll be one or two sections at the end will focus on collapse. And one of those chapters, I'm actually going to be sourcing accounts from societies that have already collapsed. Because, wow. you know, we talk about, we talk a lot about, oh, societies collapsing and stuff. And, you know, we're in quite a privileged way sometimes. But what we should be doing is actually learning from people who have been through it. Um, and how does that connect to the whole? So I'm talking about Haiti, Sudan, Myanmar, um, Obviously, you've got the Gaza situation now, but that's more like war. That's a little bit different. But but Syria, um, lots of places around the world that have experienced complete social collapse. Wow. Um, and if, if I can get some of these guys, I have some contacts. I haven't actually got anything confirmed yet, but I, I'm sure I'll get some, some good accounts. Um, then maybe we can learn something from them rather than just having the global north yeah. perspective all the time, you know? Which is really important. You have got your, you definitely have something there. Those Fantastic. stories have to be shared because nobody can make a change or, or know, you know, how to, how to survive without understanding others in those situations. And you're completely right. So thank you. I no look problem. forward to that. Yeah, this is this is one of the, the chapters I'm most excited about, actually. Yeah. Um, and then I'm actually going to be contributing a chapter my, myself. That's like the editor's privilege. I'm, I'm slipping in my own writing as well. Which is very nice. Um, I like your writing. Yeah. I've enjoyed reading your stuff. Amazing. Um, so my own chapter is going to be um, more like a strategic focus because I'm, I'm a bit of a nerdy guy about strategy and and not not necessarily putting it into practice although i hope i will get there one day but just looking at different existing movements and groups and how could they all connect together more and stuff like that you know and there's, um, a, there's quite a lot of them and they should be connected yeah, absolutely absolutely well yeah. i think by virtue of the fact that we are in a collapsing societies in many perhaps this is just a natural progression yeah, for sure. I, 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 I mean, I, I came up with, I'm a fan of Jem Bandel's work. Like, I don't always 100% agree with him, but, mm -hmm. but I pretty much, you know, I read his recent, well, it was last year, Breaking Together mm -hmm. uh, book, and, and I, I was really astounded by that book. I thought it was, like, very impactful. Um, and um, he, obviously, he started the deep adaptation yes. stuff movement. Oh, yeah. But... But when I was reading his stuff, I thought there was something a little bit missing. And what I, so I came up with this word. I'm sure I'm not the first person to come up with this phrase, but he didn't talk about what I would call deep networking. And, and for me, deep networking would be partly what we're doing now is a form of deep networking. So like really more people connecting with other people from other countries and talking about these subjects and growing in resilience together. And I know, I know a lot of people are doing this work. They just call it a different name. So this is just my typical northern white guy wanting to invent a term and everyone say, oh, that's a nice term. It's okay. You could go for <laughs> it. 
Uh, I, 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 it's fine. <laughs> yeah. yeah. So yeah, I'll be writing about this kind of stuff, and then and then the very last chapter I'm really excited will be by the Australian activist platform Just Collapse. I don't know if you've heard yeah, of them. Oh, of course, I follow them. I've known them yeah. for years. So they're going to be. After all of these diverse and interesting perspectives, some of them very sober, some of them a little bit more on the positive side or, mm-hmm. or constructive, optimistic. Um, the the very last chapter is going to be very sober and down to earth, and um, you know that their view is going to be very much. We just don't know what's going to happen. Um, right, we don't, and, and, and and we can't. You know, it's kind of a message in a way to all of the utopians that you know your revolution forget about your revolution you have to deal with collapse first or at the same time at least at the same time you know maybe some kind of revolutionary action maybe some kind of uh positive society can come out of this but it's not a guarantee and and we have to be very realistic and we don't know what's going to happen there probably will be a lot of war there probably will be a lot of famine uh disease is 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 yeah a lot of war there is. There is. I mean, there is, but but absolutely. You but think I, it's, but I mean, it's, you mean we ain't seen nothing yet. To that's put kind it of in what, uh, yeah. a New Yorker's term. Yeah. Okay. Right. Right. Okay. Mm-hmm. Is that where you're from? I'm in Western New York, but uh, oh. yes, I'm I'm from the area near the city, so you know, you ain't seen oh. nothing yet, baby. <laughs> I'm starting, I, yeah, I don't, I'm not so good at American accents, but I've suddenly realized now that you say it, it, it makes sense and I'm listening to the accent. And, yeah. Um, but yeah, so that's it. I mean, um, it, I, I think it's a really exciting book. And uh, honestly, I did some market research for this book and I honestly couldn't find, I'm not just saying this, I couldn't find any other book quite like this on the market already. And, and I unfortunately, I do have to look at a bit of a marketing angle as well because mm. it is a publisher. Well, that, we do have yeah. to book. How are people uh, supposed to hear about it without marketing it? Which is exactly. what you're doing with me right now, which is perfectly Absolutely. fine. Yeah, sure. Right. Sure. Thank you. All right. Let me ask you about Michael Dowd and post Doom and what you know about he he had passed away a year ago, Michael Dowd and his post Doom work, which was about a post-collapse society. And uh, if you know Jordan and Karen Perry, who have taken the work of collapse acceptance, do you know them? Because it might. Yeah. Well, I know, I know of their work and I, and I've looked at, I've looked at the website and, and I've, and I've seen them referenced, but I, I'm ashamed to say I don't, I haven't investigated. And maybe you can tell me more about them. Well, I will, I will send you, and I will say, and hopefully share. I will share this with Karen because I think they can be very helpful in this. And they talk about how to live meaningfully in a collapsing world. Accepting mm. the collapse is in, inevitable, and that it is where we are. And so I'm just, you know, I like to put people together that are amazing. And I think that the that this might be another area for you. And that sounds fun. Yeah, I'd love okay, to make good. a connection. And yeah. see, we're doing it right here in the interview. <laughs> Fantastic. So I, I, I've also um, forgotten to mention um, there's going to be a perspective, a couple of writers in the book from the solar punk movement perspective. Mm-hmm. And I don't know if you know, but solar oh. punk is a mm-hmm. yeah, visionary kind of art movement, which has a strong political element yep. and, and and many people would say that it's very utopian and idealistic and and you know they, they the solar punk artists might present visions of ecological cities full of geodesic domes and 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 wind wind power and um you know solar panels and and direct democracy and 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 social justice and everything being perfect and and so on and it was interesting talking to one of these contributors in particular, Luca Dowell, the host of Solar Punk Now, which is a, a podcast. I heard of and it. Uh, I'm going to appear on that as well, actually. Great. Uh, next week. So, yeah, I'm, I have two podcasts in one week, and I haven't been on any in my life before. So that's wow, nice you're a natural. You're doing very well then. Well, thank you so much, Sandy. This is Sandy. great. 
you're you're a very welcoming and relaxed host so and and you really listen and let me talk so that's that's incredible um so yeah luca um asked me some questions about is how can solar punk even coexist with collapse awareness because solar punk seems to be a mm-hmm. very optimistic utopian movement and and my response was yes it can you know human beings will always make art it doesn't matter how bad things are collapsing i think you know unless you're just about to be killed by someone literally you know you, 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 there's always space for making some kind of art you know during world war ii in europe mm-hmm. i'm sure many people felt like the world was collapsing but people still made art they still sung songs they still danced um and you had the surrealist art movement during World War II and the surrealist artists, some of them are very political, like very anti-fascist. They didn't, they didn't envision a, a future utopia, but it was like another world in a way. It was like a dream world, you know? Right. So, so I used this kind of analysis with Luca and we were talking about it and I realised that, yes, there is a place for solar punk because we need to envision the best possible collapse yeah. we need to envision like the best way to get through collapse and and that's not optimism that's not hopium and that that's that's well, just the, trying the, to make the best yeah. that's just and, trying and, to make the best pathway right. and they're out there so why should they not be in included in this i see yeah. exactly the thought that's process it. for that yeah and people can that's, take what they need from it you know, mm. learning yeah. through this art, you know, your vehicle, your book. And if it's not important to them, at least they've learned something. Yeah, Very that's important. It. And that I really appreciate what you just said about it's out there, exists, and we have to include them because that's, that's partly what my own chapter is going to be about that. You know, you have so many people trying to impose their view of how we should change, like yeah. their version of revolution or whatever. And the sad thing is for me is I, I agree with a lot of these people's ideas, but the, the only thing I don't agree with is that they say, and everyone should be doing this. Yeah, this is the and, only and way. The only way. And yeah. if you don't do this, you're betraying, you're betraying humanity. If you don't join in this protest or this social movement yeah. or whatever, then you're betraying humanity. And that's where I sort of take issue a bit. And, and, I, and I would rather see more people strategic diversity i guess you would call it strategic diversity and just yeah accepting like different views on everything what do you say to those and i know many of these people that think this way that nothing will be accomplished without violence or a violent revolution so to speak what do you say to that well it's complex i i think um Many of the so-called non-violent uh, revolutions historically, like Gandhi, Martin Luther King, mm-hmm. um, they've been whitewashed a bit. Those movements have been whitewashed a little bit. There, there, was, there were some violent tussles on the edges, okay. and, and some people, some scholars believe that the, uh, the, the tussles and also the threat from, this is the radical flank, what's known as the radical flank theory, that there was a more violent threat during Martin Luther King's time of, was it the- uh, The Black uh, Panthers? Uh, yeah, I think they were, they overlapped, but I think mm-hmm. they were generally a bit later, but it was certainly linked with the Black Panthers and, and um, Malcolm X. And, mm-hmm. and there, there was a threat of something a bit more hardcore. Mm-hmm. And so then the, to the American government, Martin Luther King suddenly looked very attractive. Um, and so, that you could say that's a non-violent movement that worked but you could also say it was the threat of violence which also played a, a role there so there's different ways of looking at things um holding it up as the okay it could happen yeah it, exactly. but, but not in a way where it's going to happen or else if you don't do this or else that's not no, no, where we want to be no, at not all. Like that. right no 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 I, I wouldn't i wouldn't support that no. kind of uh, no, but 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 you know the Black Panthers uh, arming themselves in their communities because the police, the white police, were uh, you know racist police were walking around with their guns. They and, still uh, are, hun. <laughs> yeah, and according to the American Constitution, 
if you can walk around with a gun, then that's what that was the point of the Black Panthers walking around with guns. They're saying, look, it's in the Constitution. You're walking around threatening us with your guns. We're going to walk around with our guns. And, and you know, they weren't actually shooting at people. I mean, right. yeah, OK, there were a few shootouts in the end, mm-hmm. but that's but it was defensive. And, and that's what people don't understand about the Black Panthers. And I forgot to mention that's a really key thing is um, in the second section of the book, we actually have got confirmed the Washington branch of the modern Black Panthers. So that's really, really interesting for me because I know nothing about them. Um, I know they're not all about violence for for people who don't know their history and everything. That you know, they're very much about community uh, resilience and building community resources and all of that. Mm-hmm. So that's a really exciting chapter. Um, I mean, the modern Black Panther. There are a few different modern Black Panther parties apparently, and they're they're, they're not all aligned. Like there are a few people who call themselves the Black Panthers these days. It's a bit confusing, but this is one particular branch. Okay. Um, they seem they seem very. They seem great anyway. Um, so that's a, that's quite a that's quite a catch for yes. me to get that in the book. Absolutely, uh, because the book is uh, really about diversity of thought. Absolutely, and yeah. worldview. And, that, Very and that was courtesy of Jason Baylor. So that he, he he's a radical guide. So he he was working. He's working with them to bring them on board. Um, but yeah, back to the violence question. It's a reality. Violence exists. Mm-hmm. And um, I definitely don't advocate for violent revolution. I think it's a really stupid idea. And and I think a lot of Western people who do advocate for that are romantic and they don't realize how much it's going to hurt when they get shot in the head um, or whatever. You know, they think it's going to be like in the movies or something. Um, yeah. But but it's not going to be like in the movies or, or it, yeah, it will be like the worst parts of the movies. Yeah. yeah. You're like, boom, you're but, dead. Yeah. Yeah. And so, so it's everybody you love. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. But, but the reality is in some parts of the world, I would never judge. I would never judge uh, defensive violent movements who are just fighting for their lives. So I wouldn't judge them. Like for instance, in Northern Syria, you've got the Kur- the Kurds, the Kurdish oh, people in Northern absolutely. Syria. You know, like the you know they're quite inspiring. You know, feminist and, and, and anarchistic socialist kind of movement they've got going there in northern Syria, where you've got the the, the YPJ, the female militia, and the YPG, the, the male like, and they fought against ISIS, you know, against Islamic State, and defeated them. Okay, with the help of a, a little bit of help from America, but they did a lot by themselves. Um, and at the same time, they built this kind of revolutionary experiment in northern Syria at the same time as fighting against the Islamic State. Can you imagine? I mean, that's that's kind of violent revolution in a way, but it's defensive. Mm-hmm. It's, it's a quite a defensive revolution and that they were protecting their territory largely as far as I understand it, mm-hmm. uh, fighting against Islamic State, which I think most people can agree is a pretty good sort of uh, a pretty clear enemy um i mean i i hate all religious fundamentalism whether it's christian islamic um yeah but, but, because it's yeah. it leads it's fundamentalism but it's supremacism and this is what we're yeah. seeing in the united states in israel the supremacism of their religions which is underscoring these genocides sure. and these these awful situations i agree with you there yeah, yeah. um i mean it's, it's super complex in, in in the middle east isn't it and, and super um, complex yeah and and i don't know what trump's uh, ascendancy is going to do to that situation but it's probably not going to be good is it i don't <laughs> think so I we're, yeah. we're, I actually feel sick to my stomach thinking about what can happen right away in January over there to the yeah. rest of the people that have already suffered mm. hideously. But that's yeah. nothing new to the world. Yeah. I mean, and you're, so, and you're going to illustrate it by bringing on people that have already experienced collapse in their society. So this is really positive from a negative yeah absolutely um and some of those accounts there might be some violence involved because that's the reality the reality on the ground but it's not going to be 
as we've established, it's not going to be you better do what I say or, or right. I'm going to. It's more like defensive violence mm-hmm. against, you know, roving, roving gangs or whatever, you know, defending yourself against these people. Yeah. Okay. Um, Gail Bradbrook, actually, who's writing the forward, um, I saw a video of her recently to kind of get more of an idea of what she might write in the forward for the book. And everybody thinks of her, or well, not everybody, but some people think of her as a kind of bit of a hippie, like what founder of Extinction Rebellion and right. peace and love, peace and love. But actually, like she's quite realistic. And in this talk I saw her give, she said, you know, we need to get real because when if society collapses and somebody comes with a knife for your children, you're not going to sit there singing Kumbaya. That's no. what she said. No, so that, I am that, you know, I'm with her 100 percent. Yeah. Mm-hmm. So that's it, you know, it, violence only by necessity, not not as a not as a kind of dominant strategy. That's what I would say. Okay, thank you. Yeah. Thank you. But I respect, you know, different. It's interesting that, you know, people who actually think it should be a mm-hmm. strategy to use to, to mm-hmm. a, a central strategy to use. I violence. know people that think all over <laughs> with so many different worldviews. And it helps me sure. shape my own, which I would never mm. force on anyone else. Because mm. as an educator with a YouTube channel, this is what you do. You bring on all the different yeah. worldviews and then people that are watching are going to make up their mind for themselves, whether they say, oh, I, I'm going to be participating in this. I buy what this person's saying. And you're articulating it well. Great. Right. I mean, I would say, you know, if 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 society is collapsing and, and me and you think it is and, and we'll do further, then it, it would make sense, even if we try as, as much as possible to, 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 to stay with nonviolence. At the same time, I think it is quite important for anyone watching to learn some self-defense skills if you don't know them already. <laughs> you, 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 my thought was right there. Was it? My the right. self defense. I mean, I'm completely 100 percent with you there, and I am one yeah. of those people. Yeah, because you know, like especially, I don't want to be patriarchal or sound sexist or patronizing, but you know, generally, you know, a lot of women have weaker sort of upper body strength than men, and so for women in particular who are going to be vulnerable to to mm-hmm. to to violence and rape you know in a, in a broken down society i would particularly you know uh, um, th- think that they should 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 learn some some serious that's self-defense not skills. patriarchal that's reality yeah. of being yeah. a woman and i have yeah, been yeah. in situations where that were not good and that's just our reality. And in the United States, it's only going to get worse because of the supremacism that we are witnessing percolating to the top. I call it trickle down fascism, but percolating yeah. or trickle up fascism, trickle down fascism. But it's it's what's happening here. And a lot of people yeah. are fearful, but you have to prepare for that. And you do have to become strong. You can't yeah. sit back and, and just live in fear. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, yeah. I won't. <laughs> Great. So, yeah, I mean, um, that's that's all I can think of on the on the book right now. But um, except to say, except except to say to everyone watching, please, please donate. Um, we've done really well, me and a little team of volunteers. We've got to three and a half thousand pounds now. Okay. We've made that. But we have to hit the five thousand or about. It, it could go slightly below, but pretty much five thousand. So we we've made seventy percent. We're seventy percent, but we've only got one week for the last one and a half thousand, which right. is quite a tall. That's quite I'll a tall. I'll get this walk. out. And anybody that's listening, please, if you if you can afford something, this is a very worthwhile project. Thank you, Sandy. Also, I should say just a £10 donation, which is about 13 US dollars, I think, gets you an e-copy of the book. So you're essentially just pre-ordering the book if, if you donate right. now. You're, I think you're, that's what I did you, today, but it was £20? Yeah. Um, that, that, that's probably you clicked on giving an extra £10 to Arcbound Foundation. Mm-hmm. Um, but it's, but okay. it, you, can, you can just click on... Um, you can just click on 
no no donation to Artbound Foundation and just ten pounds for the e copy of the book, and then or, or twenty pounds for a physical copy of the book um, as mm-hmm. well. And then the, and then there are different bundles. You can get more books for higher donations. And if you can, if you donate, I can't remember the level. Mm-hmm. Could be above fifty pounds or something, which is quite a lot. Then the reward is includes some writing mentoring from myself. So very I, nice, for, really. For any writing project that you're working on. Oh, that's cool. But Will would, you be doing an audio book or is this something really that's interactive that, that people need to feel and read themselves? Because you know people's attention span, including mine, since the social media revolution, are like the size of a penny, you know. Yeah. Well, I would love to do an audio version. Um, we're a very small charity publisher based in the UK and you know, like the, 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 the fundraising landscape is very difficult at the mm-hmm. moment. Um, so if we can make, if we can get the funds within the next week to ensure this book goes ahead mm-hmm. and then, and then if enough people promote it, you know, I'm going to work hard on making partnerships with people to promote the book. Um, right. and then if, if it sells well enough as well on top of that, then we might be able to make just a little bit. I mean, it's a not-for-profit, but, yeah, but, but, but we, might be, able to, we uh, might be able to do an audio book. I'm yeah. thinking of an audio book could be volunteers just to read one chapter each. Sure. And that could be a way for you to do it audio. I mean, Michael Dowd in his writings, he used to he used to read his own stuff. He wrote, he read Overshoot. Right. William Catton's overshoot. Yeah. He read it. So there's ways to do things that may not have to cost, you know, that's depending depending on true. what kind of voice. Like I probably would not say I would be a, a person that would want to narrate it, <laughs> you know, read yeah. it. But there are <laughs> those that might want to volunteer that have lovely voices with no, you know, ridiculous inflection that could help. So there's something to think yeah. about. That is something to think about. That's mm-hmm. a very, very good idea. I'm definitely going to think about yeah, that. There's yeah. a lot of people that would like to volunteer to do things like that. It's meaningful. Mm-hmm. Absolutely. Right. Yeah. And that will bring it to a, a wider audience, as you said. Mm-hmm. You know, people driving to work can listen to it. Yes. And, and do it. Exactly. That. I'm out in my garden. And I'm always listening to either audiobooks or so certain podcasts. I'm working and listening and learning at the same time. It's also really important for partially sighted people. Actually, yes, there's a guy great. there's a guy that got in touch with me and he asked me, Will there be an audio version? Because All right. you know, I knew that he was partially sighted. So yeah, for, for, for partially sighted and, and blind people, that would be okay. um, amazing as well. Yeah. Well then anybody out there who would like to volunteer their voice in reading a chapter of this, you can contact Matthew, and that would be great. Absolutely. Thank you, Sandy. Well, I've very much enjoyed learning about this project and ARC publishers and everything, everything you've discussed. I would like you to give us a closing uh, of what you'd like to say to those of us that will be watching and following the project. Well, first of all, I just want to say thank you so much, Sandy, for, for having me on the podcast. Like I, I, I was checking out some of your videos again earlier and, and I really like uh, your content and you do some really fun stuff as well. For everyone watching, just please give this book a chance. It really yes. is uh, a, a very unique book. You know, there's, there, there isn't, as far as I'm aware, there is no other book that exists which combines collapse awareness uh, the climate crisis and multi-author perspectives from around the world, including yes. people who have already been through collapse. Um, you know, as I said, we've got some really exciting, diverse voices. We've got the Black Panther Party, Washington Branch. We've got uh, solar punk perspectives. We've got a very respectable climate scientist, Bill McGuire from the UK. We've got Gail Bradbrook, co-founder of the Extinction Rebellion movement. We've got Brian Tokar, who's a climate justice activist and author. He's also uh, on the social ecology side, you know, Murray Bookchin side. Mm -hmm. Um, And yeah, we've got Violet Materi from Kenya, like amazing ecological anti-colonial activist, um, gathering community accounts. So yeah, it's it's a big party of a book. (laughs) But this is great. Thank you. That's really nice. All right, everybody. Well, 
this has been wonderful. We've learned something and we have something to look forward to, something that we can really put our hands around, put our minds around, and hopefully bring a lot of meaning to what our lives, what the next step is in all of our lives everywhere around the world. Thank you, Matthew. Thanks, Sandy.